Hey, how's it going and welcome back. Today I wanted to walk through the UNet convolutional neural network and explain kind of the overall architecture, kind of walk through the, the paper and, and kind of break down some of the different um, modules and the different like building blocks that are used to make up this particular architecture. The reason I'm going to be doing this is because in some of the upcoming videos I want to dive into some um, semantic segmentation problems using convolutional neural networks. One of the basic and um, most well-known architectures that's used for these particular problems is the UNET. And I figure if we can go ahead and walk through the paper and an explanation on what's happening, how they're able to take an input image and produce an output mask um, using kind of the basic convolutional building blocks, we can walk through that um, that that concept and that particular logic and get into and start to understand you know how these particular problems are 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 tackled and solved. So basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and walk through the ideas of it in this particular video. In the following video I'm going to actually walk through how to code up um, one of these models in TensorFlow using Python and then we're going to then use it on a test data set that I found that's used for this particular problem. And then um, I have some further further ideas and where we're gonna go ahead and take um, different architectures that are designed to do the same thing, um, walk through those papers as well, um, code them up and then compare them on this data set to kind of break down how you might um, you know, investigate you know, different models for the same problem, right? So kind of kind of going back to the deep learning framework idea, you know, we kind of create, created that framework so that if you have one particular data set and one particular problem, you can go ahead and interchange different models and different architectures um, seamlessly and, and um, very easily in order to train those new architectures and then compare the outputs, right? So once you get the different outputs from the different models, you can perform different types of analysis in order to determine you know, which particular architecture is working better for your problem. And then also maybe some further analysis into why. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started and, and start diving into this paper. So I have this pulled up here. Um, here are the authors, and this is the UNET um, for convolutional neural networks for biomedical image segmentation. So let's go ahead and I've kind of highlighted just kind of the, the high points, the things that I think are important to kind of take away. I'm not going to go through the entire paper. If you would like to, you can go ahead and, and Google this and go ahead and I'll actually link it in the description below so you can go ahead and walk through it yourself. Um, so yeah, let's get started. So the architecture consists of a contracting path to capture context and a symmetric expanding path that enables precise localization. Um, we show that such a network can be trained end to end um, from very few images, right? And out, outperform, outperforms the prior best methods. Um, so we'll, we'll get into what that kind of looks like and what that actually means. So um, again, kind of highlighting the fact deep convolutional neural networks have outperformed the state of the art in many visual recognition tasks. So obviously um, CNNs were designed for um, image classification originally, and now they're being expanded um, beyond that to um, submit um, segmentation tasks, right? Where you, instead of you're classifying an entire image, you're actually classifying each pixel within the image, right? So again, classification tasks. And then the desired output should include localization, right? So now you're localizing the class. So a class label is supposed to be assigned to each pixel. So this can take the the this can take the form of you know it could be a binary classification task where you just have background and then one task, and then you're trying to label all of the pixels and, and you know segment like hey if there's a person in this image I want to segment all the pixels that belong to a person. Um, this can also be expanded beyond that to multi-class classification tasks where you have, you know, let's say you have dogs, cats, people, buses, right? Things, things of that nature, different, different classes where you want to segment each pixel and then also designate um, which pixel belongs to each task. Um, and then here is an overview of the UNET architecture. So let's go ahead and take a look at this um, diagram here. So if you take a look, we have our input image it's just a tile of the image, right? So in, in this paper, they talk about how they have these big scans and what they do is they actually tiled up the scans into little image chips. Um, and then each chip is then fed into this network. So then they're, they're kind of taking in the local context, right? You have, you know, just one local image chip and then you're able to use that for um, the input, input feature. So you take that, that image tile, it's passed through. If you take a look over here, 
um, go ahead and highlight this take a look over here that the blue arrows are convolutional layers um, so it's basically a three by three which means a um, kernel of th um, three by three kernel and then um, relu activation so we're going to go ahead and pass it through two convolutional blocks and then once that is the input image is passed through the two convolutional blocks that that output is then sent to the end of the network right so these are kind of our our um, skip or residual connections and i'll kind of come back and talk about those in a moment but let's go ahead and follow the the um the pooling path right like the contractive path here so this is if you really look at it right now i kind of want to highlight that actually so if you really look at it you kind of split it in half right so you kind of have your encoder and your decoder so the encoder of this network is the same as a traditional convolutional neural network one that's used for um, image classification tasks so basically what you're doing is you're taking an input image um, you're you're basically decreasing decreasing the spatial or downsampling the spatial footprint of of the image and then also as you're going deeper you're increasing the the feature space or the number of number of channels right and then what it's doing is it's learning these different kernels and these different um, spatial features at each each hierarchical level of the of the image right as it's downsampled so as it's downsampled it's actually taking um closer and closer looks um and and and, and more closer smaller and smaller context looks at the at the original input image and then also deeper feature spaces right so it's able to build deep hierarchical feature spaces about about the image so convolutional neural networks are really really good at that the only problem is is there's no local understanding right there's no spatial understanding to those features so you go through the two convolutional blocks you'd go through a max pooling you go through two more convolutional blocks you go through another max pooling and as you're going down that the features are, are increasing by two right so at the beginning i think it starts with 64 input features um, and then you want so you want 64 um, kernels and then you go ahead and then you multiply that by two to 128 and then go down again so another max pooling operation then you go multiply it by two so now you have 256 features and then you go ahead and max pool again and you get to the 512 and then you do a final max pooling and you get to 1024 um, channels so i think at the end you end up having yeah 32 by 32 um, size chip right or let's let's say for example you start with a 256 by 256 image chip it'll down sample um, after the max pooling it'll go to a 128 by 128 and then you do another max pooling it'll go to 64 by 64 another max pooling you go to 32 by 32 and then the final max pooling so your final feature space at the bottom of your encoder is going to be a 16 by 16 by 1000 um, so 16 by 16 spatial spatial block and then you're going to have 1024 um, channels to that block right so that's kind of the the end global feature feature space of the input image so that's what we kind of call the bridge right so then the bridge is then passed to the decoder so you kind of have down here you end up getting your global features and then at each level so over here you kind of have this is your local features for this particular um, spatial size these are kind of your local features for this size your local features and your local features right so then what you do in order to help the decoder make sense local sense of of the information right that's coming from from the deep global feature space what it does is it then just concatenates it or adds it in right so we go ahead and kind of erase some of this stuff so basically all it does is it you can see here it adds it in so you add these local features um local features in with kind of these global features you pass them through another convolutional block another two more convolutional blocks and then you do an upsample right and then again you kind of these original input input information is then concatenated so that it's it's added in after it's been globally um, globally condensed and then you add in those features do two more convolutional blocks you do an upsampling and then again at each each level of the unit as you're going back up the decoder you're constantly adding in this this feature space with um, the features that are derived from coming through right so so these features are then added with features that were generated by going all the way through this part of the network and then these features are added together with features that went all the way through the network right to really help it 
get that global, um, really it, it is able to leverage the, the deep global features that are learned by, um, by convolutional neural networks, but then uh, it allows it to maintain and retain that, that high level local feature, right? So then at the, at the output, then it, whatever input image size you, you started with then becomes the output size. So then you're passed through two more convolutional layers and then it's passed through a one by one convolutional operation. And what that does is it then creates a, a mask, right? So, so let's say, um, I have one or a binary classification problem. It'll create a um, two, let's say I had an input of 256 by 256, and let's say I had an RGB, so it's by three, three channels. This output, if it's a binary classification problem, would then be a 256 by 256 by one. So then each pixel then becomes a probability of it belonging to um, either our class one or class zero, binary being there's only zero and one. And then you would then pass that through what's called the sigmoid activation function, which would then to, well, yeah, actually, you would the the outputs would then um, come into the mask, and then you would pass it through the sigmoid act activation function to generate the probability of it belonging to one or the other class, right? Um, let's say it's a multi-class classification problem. Well, then it's going to be let's say I have ten classes, then the output's going to be a two fifty six by two fifty six by ten channel deep, right? Um, mask, and then what's going to happen is there's going to be values in all of those all of in that entire array. And then you're going to pass a softmax function across each pixel. And what the softmax fu max function does is it then determines which one of those, it then creates um, basically probabilities across the classes. And then whichever one has the highest probability um, will then be the class that's being, um, that it's being, that it's most likely to belong to, right? So let's say um, index three of that, that pixel is um, the highest probability let's say it's at like 0.8 percent and that's that's the highest one then um that is says that for that class for that pixel it's predicting that it belongs to class three so that's kind of the basics of it it's basically just a, a, a normal convolutional neural network that is then um a, as the encoder which is then attached to a symmetric decoder right so it's kind of the same whatever types of operations are happening on the encoder, the exact opposite, so the exact symmetric operations are happening happening um, on, during the decoder, and then these residual connections of, of the higher level spatial information are then added into the decoder to help it understand globally and spatially what's going on, and it helps it determine um, the per pixel um, classification of the input image. So go ahead and move on. So. Yeah, so another modification of their architecture is the upsampling part. Um, they also have a large number of feature channels, which allows the network to propagate context information to high re higher resolution layers, right? So kind of what we were talking about. Um, so as a consequence, the expansive path is more or less symmetric to the contracting path and yields a U-shaped architecture. The U network does not have any fully connected layers and only uses the valid part of the convolution, right? So it's only using convolutional um, layers, there's no densely connected layers or anything of that nature. Um, another challenge, um, use the weighted loss, right? Okay, so here's kind of another, um, kind of a highlight, something to kind of keep in consideration is um, separation of touching objects of the same class. So they propose the use of a weighted loss where separating the background labels between touching cells um, attains an, a, a large weight in the loss function, right? So kind of, again, helping it since it's kind of a convolutional operation, right? And also I'll sh when we get to talking about the metrics that are used for these, you use what's called like, like IOU um, based metrics, things like that, and based loss functions and kind of the nature of those things, right? If you look at the simple Jacquard loss or simple IOU loss, um, if, if you've ever had to like vacuum seal something, this is how I like to envision it. If you've ever had to vacuum seal something, whenever you're you're like sucking the air out of the vacuum seal compartment, as the as the plastic kind of starts to f like form and mold around the object on the inside, that's kind of the nature of those losses and kind of how they they operate. So the tendency then is is it to have kind of these encompassing um, predictions, and sometimes pixels within those kind of um, sometimes can be kind of thrown in, right? So these, these different types of weighted losses are, are to kind of help 
Um, and there's also more metrics and more losses that have been um, developed that, that kind of help to mitigate that issue and help to make sure that on a per pixel basis, we're not, you're not just throwing them in because, because the neighboring pixels are also um, of, of a particular class, right? It's making sure to, to take a look at each pixel and make sure to, that there isn't things that are just getting blanketed, you know, right? Each one is actually um, properly representative of, of the class it belongs to. So, um, if I was, yeah, right. So here again, just kind of talking about it, it follows um, the typical architecture of a convolutional neural network um, using um, rectified linear unit activation, right? ReLU or, or, or any types of its variants. And then in this particular original paper, they use a two by two max pooling operation for downsampling with a stride of two, right? So um, once we get into coding um, ours, I'm going to talk about how there's different different techniques for um, downsampling beyond just max pooling, right? There's average pooling, and then there's also what's called like kind of like a strided pooling, where you're, instead of using a max pooling um, layer, you're using just a normal convolutional layer, and you're, you're adding um, different strides to it, right? Um, increasing the stride length of it in order to do um, a, and also um, not using same padding, but using what's called valid padding in order to um, basically do the same type of pooling operation, but it, it doesn't necessarily gloss over um, different features, right? So sometimes it's actually more more useful to do some sort of strided pooling when you're doing some kind of um, encoder, decoder, like semantic segmentation type um, operation, right? So, um, and I think that's kind of it, right? So, and then also kind of another highlight. So just a little bit in this paper, they talked about how they're using a data set that's pretty small. So because they don't have a lot of images, they were able to leverage a lot of data augmentation um, techniques um, in order to boost the, the classification power of their, their, their network and their model. I will say, just to highlight on this, um, there's a lot of image class or data augmentation techniques used for traditional image classification that aren't necessarily um, valid when it comes to semantic segmentation because you have that spatial um, you need to have that spatial awareness, right? So some of them aren't as useful and can't be used um, interchangeably, but maybe we'll get into that kind of later in, in a different um, example. And then to, here, I just kind of wanted to highlight, right? Kind of a couple of the different um, image, outside of just straight image classification, kind of the different image um, um, techniques, right? That are being used. So you kind of have the object detection which is, you know, you have people and you want to draw bounding boxes around different objects within an image. And then what we're talking about with the unit is what's called semantic segmentation, right? So, so these people all belong to the people class and then everything in the background belongs to the non-people class. So this is kind of a binary classification problem. So the gist of it is all of them are segmented as one. And then when you get to something um, a little bit more complex called instance segmentation, which is not done using a unit, um, you have you want to segment each instance of the class, right? So it's it's almost a combination of object detection and semantic segmentation all in one, right? Where you want to these are all people and they all belong to the people class, but they're se um, segmented um, as their own object in their own instance. So just to kind of highlight um, the little bit the little difference between the, between the two things, right? And then, so here, kind of just to take a look at another basic, you know, basically similar to the unit, right? This is the basic idea behind um, semantic segmentation to, um, networks. You know, you take your input image, you convolve things down, and then you, you, you encode them, and then you decode them, right, to the segmentation output. So this is kind of, kind of what that would look like. Here, this is a little different than instant segmentation, though, because you might be kind of wondering, you know, that, oh, that looks like instant segmentation. Well, this isn't because these are all different classes. Before, if you look at instance segmentation, they're all the same class, but then they're segmented as different instances of that class. Here, this is a multi-class semantic segmentation problem where you have multiple classes. So you have, you know, it looks like maybe roads, sidewalk, cars, trees, um, sky. So, so it, it looks similar, but this is, this is still a semantic segmentation problem. It's just a multi-class version of it. And then here, kind of just again, to kind of visualize what I was talking about, you take that input image, you pass it through the unit, and then you get this output array. So um, here's your your per, per pixel values. And then it's um, the number of channels is the number of classes you have. So if this would be, this would be um, technically like a three class, um, multi-class problem here. So you would take 
this pixel, you would pass it through the softmax function, and then these would then turn into um, values between zero and one, and then the one with the maximum value would be the one that's most likely to belong to your target class, right? And then you would do that for each each pixel stack. So this could be up to however many classes you have. So they say it's like 10, right? It'd be each pixel stack is then passed through that softmax, softmax activation. So yeah, here, just give you kind of an idea of a couple of the general um, known uh, architectures used for object detection. You have the debtor. Um, I think that was designed and built by Facebook. You have RetinaNet. So these ones are used specifically for object detection where you're drawing that bounding box around um, the objects in the image. Instant segmentation architectures. You have the mask RCNN and then you have PanNet. And then um, I did have a, a, a slide in here too, but you also, then you have for, um, then you have for semantic segmentation, you have, you know, like UNet, UNet++, plus plus, um, different um, variants of that, right? You also have um, what's called VIT, which is a visual transformer, right? It's kind of, I think it was also designed by, by Facebook, by, I believe, but they um, use transformer architectures for image classification, which is the VIT, but that can also be adapted for this particular task, which is um, semantic segmentation um, and, and things of that nature. So that's kind of the gist, kind of the rundown, a little bit um, of a, a backfill on what this architecture is used for and the types of problems that, that I'm kind of going to want to dive into coming up. In the next video, I'm going to go through how to actually code this this UNet architecture up using TensorFlow. Um, it's actually a lot more straightforward and easy than you might you might think. Um, what's really nice about these architectures is you know they're kind of built on little blocks, right? You know, convolutional blocks that are then built onto you know the encoder block, and then they kind of all fit together in these little blocks, and and they're relatively easy to get going. So um, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you got something meaningful out of it, and I'll see you next time.